Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. At first glance at this passage this morning, the defining question is pretty obvious. So obvious I think my dog could understand it. My dog is one of the dumbest creatures I've ever met. Um, it's pretty obvious, and it's actually the first, first question in your outline. Who is my neighbor? I think we've probably all heard this many, many times before, and when we read the parable, it's probably the first question that comes to our mind. And the answer is pretty obvious, too. Everyone is our neighbor. All right, end of sermon. Let's do the offerings now. I'm just kidding. You are not getting off that easily this morning. The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? And the fact that it's a lawyer asking the question should be a red flag at first. Um, are there any lawyers in here? Okay, I can tell this joke. Um, how can you tell a lawyer is lying? His lips are moving. Now, to be fair, there are plenty of quality honest lawyers in the world out there, but this guy is, he's tricky. His motives are not what we think they are, because it seems like an innocent question on the surface, but it's really a self-limiting and self-justifying question. Basically, he's asking Jesus, who are the people to whom I don't have to be a neighbor? And it's kind of a question I ask myself, too, in so many words, anytime I don't feel like helping someone. My motives are the same as the lawyers sometimes, quite frankly. I see a situation with high potential for discomfort and awkwardness, and I just ask, hmm, are they really my neighbor? Do I really need to get out of my comfort zone? And I hate to break it to you, but who is my neighbor is the wrong question to be asking from the story today. Let's try a different, more appropriate question. Spoiler alert, it's the sermon title. Why be a neighbor? That's the right question in my always humble opinion. And the answer we get from Jesus is an amazing one. Just a really, really special one, full of the good news, but you're going to have to stay awake for at least the next 10 minutes to find out the answer. Um, except for Dave, because he's already seen the PowerPoint. So he's probably just going to be up there playing his Game Boy or something. I don't know what, what he does. But let's see if we can find the answer. We aren't neighbors because it's easy. Would you all agree? Being a neighbor to people we don't like is often incredibly difficult. Tom Hanks says in the movie, A League of Their Own, if it were easy, everyone would do it. If being a neighbor were easy, everyone would do it. But it's not. Honestly, it may come easily sometimes, but if we expect it to be a cakewalk, we are limiting ourselves just like the lawyer and just like the Levite and just like the priest. And it definitely wasn't an easy thing for the Samaritan. This is the part of the sermon where I rattle off a bunch of interesting facts to impress you, so pay attention. The distance from Jerusalem to Jericho is about 17 miles. And I don't know, have you ever walked that road when you've been an Israel pastor? Okay. So I can get away with embellishing it now, right? Uh, for those of you who have been wondering, that's the exact distance from the front door of this church down to the Flathead Picnic area south of Big Fork, just past Bear Dance Lane on Highway 35. Yes, I measured that. The route in the parable would have been a little different than the one going from here to Big Fork, too. Instead of seeing Flathead Lake out to your left, it was a huge rocky desert that you walked through, and it was about a 3,300-foot descent, so you'd practically be rolling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And the rocks and the desert area really made it easy for robbers to hide out and waylay innocent travelers. And on top of this, the Samaritan knew, probably knew, if he stopped to help this guy, he would have just as much a chance of getting jumped as the Jew had. 
And on top of that, Jews hated Samaritans. And I mean they hated them. They viewed Samaritans as half-breeds, both physically and spiritually. And the Jews had also destroyed a Samaritan temple in the 2nd century BC in Gerizim. So this is, this is basically the equivalent of you taking a hike through Glacier Park on a hot August day and coming across an Islamic terrorist who has been mauled by a bear and you stop to help the man even though he at an earlier point in time destroyed your church and his sole mission in life may or may not be to kill you and by stopping you run as, ru as much risk of getting mauled by the bear as this guy does. That's the equivalent of what this Samaritan did. That doesn't sound easy, does it? Or maybe we should put it this way. It would be something like Jesus stopping to help you and me. Right? We don't like to admit it, but we are the enemies of God until Jesus comes and saves us. And the road he walked was full of betrayal, full of sadness, full of insults. He gave up the conveniences of heaven to come down here for us. But he didn't do it because it was easy. He did it because that's how much he loves each and every one of you. Each and every one of you. And what a great chance that is for us to witness, right? When we go and help people and it's not easy, people take a look and they say, man, there's something different about those Christians. And then they come and ask, why, why do you do that when it's not easy? And then we tell them, because Jesus loved me when it wasn't easy either. So we don't do it because it's easy. We aren't neighbors because we get something out of it. You ever notice how there's a big what's in it for me attitude when people are helping? I did that all the time when I was little. Joel, go wash the dishes. Well, do I get an ice cream cone if I do that? Joel, go clean your room. Well, do I get a new Lego set if I do that? There's, a, there's this attitude that it isn't worth helping someone unless I get something out of it, unless I get some recognition, unless I get some money, or at the very least, I should feel better about myself after doing it. But the Samaritan wasn't in it for himself. Not for fame, not for money, not for feelings of self-righteousness. In fact, he had very little guarantee of any self-gain from this. I mean, there were no Channel 5 news helicopters floating over for, you know, five or ten minutes of fame. Um, the only people that would have seen him were the robbers themselves, and I don't think he was going to try and impress them. No, the only, the only thing he was in it for was for the other man. He wasn't in it for himself, and neither was Jesus Christ. Isaiah tells us in chapters 52 and 53 of his prophecy about the coming Messiah that his appearance was disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. And then he says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Jesus didn't come to draw attention to himself. He didn't do it because he was going to get some grand glory. In, in fact, if you remember in John chapter 8, he says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. No, he wasn't in it for himself. You don't leave heaven and come here to be betrayed, to die a horrible death just for self-righteousness. No, you do that because your love for humanity is the purest, most beautiful love man has ever seen or ever will see. It's a love that didn't consider coming to earth and dying too much, too inconvenient. It's because he loves you that much. We aren't neighbors because it's cheap. There's some old Holiday Inn commercials my dad loves to reference. And my grandparents are here. I don't know if they can attest to this. Anytime someone in these commercials wants some sort of nice expense for themselves, a character in the commercial belts out, what do you think this is, a Holiday Inn? And so my dad loved to use that line on our family trips when we'd ask for things like 
food, water, <laughs> bathroom stops. All right, I'm kidding about the food, water, and bathroom stops. But he would naturally say that when we'd ask for something a little more expensive. Um, I always laughed and then just kind of rolled my eyes after that. But I think we often avoid things because of the high cost that comes to us. Helping a neighbor, especially one we don't like, that feels like you're spending a little bit more than you would on someone you do like, right? A little bit more time, a little bit more energy, a little bit more focus. It cost the Samaritan a lot. He risked his reputation. What if people saw him helping a hated enemy? It'd be like a flathead high school student cheering for a Glacier Wolf Pack student at the Crosstown football game. Unthinkable, right? Come on, this, I thought I'd get more of a laugh. <laughs> Help me out here, guys. Furthermore, the Samaritan gave up a great deal of money. Don't ask me how I came up with this number. I, I've said repeatedly they do not teach math at seminary. And I stand by that statement. But the modern equivalent to two pieces of silver which the guy gave to the innkeeper would be about $300. And to someone like a Samaritan, that wasn't chump change. That price seemed like a small fortune. And not only that, he says, I will give you these two pieces of silver, and then, if there are any more expenses, I'm going to come back and pay for them in full. My dad sometimes says, the sky's the limit, guys. So he's not, he's not like... Um, the holiday in all the time. But that's basically what this guy was saying. The sky is the limit on how much I'm willing to spend to help this hated enemy. That's incredible. Incredible. And it brings us to the last answer to our question. Or at last to the answer to our question. We are neighbors because every person is worth the blood of of Jesus. Let me say that again. We are neighbors because every person is worth the blood of Jesus. The Samaritan didn't think the risk of shedding his blood was too much to help this guy. And the crazy thing about the man who told this parable, Jesus, is he knew. He knew that it would cost him his blood and his life for our salvation. It wasn't about weighing the risks and rewards. It wasn't about wondering, eh, how much am I going to have to give up? It was about guaranteed suffering for our guaranteed salvation. And that's amazing. And maybe sometimes we have to give up these little things to help people. Maybe it's the comforts, maybe it's money, maybe it's effort, whatever it is. But when we think that the precious blood of Jesus was shed for us, it seems like a small price what we need to give up, right? That price was paid because according to Jesus' definition of a neighbor, a neighbor is not someone who receives mercy, it's someone who shows mercy. It's someone like the Samaritan and Jesus Christ, who when they see someone in need, they don't come along and say, are you my neighbor? They stop and say, I am a neighbor because this person and that person is worth the blood of Jesus. And we have all kinds of neighbors, don't we? The person in the hospital, in bed, who just would give anything to get a visit. The person who hasn't been to church in months and needs a phone call. They probably wonder if anyone here cares about them. The terrorist over in Afghanistan who's killing our fellow Christians but needs prayer. People like Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and just about every other politician in the world who need our prayers and our support. The people you don't like, the annoying in-laws, the annoying relatives, the parent who is obnoxious, the sibling who is overbearing, the younger brother or sister, everyone in our lives, and I have this problem too, I, I can tell right, right when I'm interacting with someone I don't like, man, it's going to take some effort. And so I say a prayer, God, help me be a neighbor 
to this person because you have been a neighbor to me. And that's why we're a neighbor. Because Jesus Christ came from heaven, he walked that road of suffering, and he didn't think it was too much trouble, too much cost, too much convenience to come and save us and bind our wounds and pay his life and then continue to help us saying, no cost is too great for the people that I love. So let's go and be neighbors, guys. Keep praying that God will fill your heart with that love that he has shown us. Go walk that rocky road. Risk the awkwardness. Risk the loss. Risk everything you have because they are worth every ounce of love you have to give. Because Jesus gave every ounce he had for you. God bless us as we try to be neighbors to those in need. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.